hope you all enjoyed lunch. So, like Tyler mentioned, we're going to be talking about the power of visitor segmentation today. So, before we begin, a little bit about myself. I'm Ignatius Chen. I also go by Iggy, which a lot of you might have heard. And I'm the head of business intelligence at Azoic. So, about half of you probably just asked yourself, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's actually pretty simple. So, as you might know, Azoic is a data company. So we track and analyze all sorts of metrics. So I'm in charge of publisher data. So any metric with a dollar sign in front of it, basically. And so I use that data in order to help improve your sites. So that's good news for you guys. The bad news, however, is that this presentation is going to get a little bit nerdy. And I know it's just after lunch, but I promise it's going to be worth it. So prior to working at Azoic, I worked in consulting right here in New York City, and I also graduated from MIT. Now, Mom, if you're watching this later on YouTube, I promise I'm still using that chemical engineering degree that you paid for. <laughs> Outside of work, I'm also a big traveler and a huge foodie, so if anyone wants to talk shop afterwards, as I've already talked with a lot of you about, let me know. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about here today? Well, first we're going to understand why would anyone want to segment their users, as well as how to do so. And then we're going to talk about, once we've identified our user segments, how we can optimize our sites in order to take advantage of that information. And finally, we're going to talk about how to recruit some of the latest deep learning techniques in order to help with some of the more difficult optimizations. Okay, so Azoic is like a lot of other companies, that we have a fantasy football league. So in fantasy football, you pick professional players to be on your team, and then you compete in imaginary matches based on how they did in the normal football season. So for example, I could pick Tom Brady, because I know he's the best quarterback. <coughs> Just kidding, go, go Birds. <laughs> So our fantasy league is composed of 14 players, um, and we did a live auction draft, and they compete weekly. But also because we're a Zoic, we always have to do things just a little differently. That's why we created our meta fantasy football league. That's right, you read that correctly. We created a fantasy league for our fantasy league. So in meta fantasy football, we pick people from the office to be our players, and then we compete based on how they did in the regular fantasy football league. The cool thing about meta fantasy football is that I don't actually need to know anything about football in order to participate. For example, last season I picked Ohad because he's always talking up a big game in the office, so I think he'll do well. And good thing too, because Ohad actually won our fantasy football league, Ooh. so he gets a shout, shout out in this presentation. Good job, Ohad. <laughs> So you can see we have these two really different leagues, and they actually have two really different types of players. On one hand, we have our uh, super users. Um, these are our dedicated fans who are in the real fantasy league. They most likely follow all the games, they know all the stats and the players, and they're constantly tweaking their lineup in order to get an advantage. On the other hand, we have our casual users. These are people like me. I don't know anything about football. I don't know the names of the players. Most of the times, I don't even know who's playing. And let's be honest, I just set the same lineup every week and kind of pray for the best. So once we have identified these two different players, um, we can make some changes to our sites. As a publisher, um, we want to adapt our sites, because now we know that there's two different types of users within these sites. So we're actually going to walk through a case study of how to optimize based on user behavior today using a site called TigerNet.com. And this site has these exact user segments. So TigerNet started as a news and social media community for Clemson sports. So they mostly cover college football, but they also do a little bit of professional football too. So they're actually the perfect site in order to investigate. And before anyone says anything, I know that there's a big difference between college and professional football. But just for the sake of this example, let's behave their users behave basically the same. 
I also wanted to say a big thank you to TigerNet.com. They couldn't be with us here today at the conference, but they've given us permission to use the site for a case study. So all the numbers that we're going to be reviewing here today are actual real numbers that I've pulled in my research on user segmentation. So let's start by looking at how to spot one of these hardcore super fans on our site while they're trying to look at the latest news in order to set their optimal fantasy football lineup. So we profile our users before they be even begin browsing our site. We want to look at things like where they're browsing in from, what time of day it is, what device they're using, and even the weather in some instances. So this example user, they're coming in from the US, South, Car uh, South Carolina specifically, um, and we know that's probably a good indication that they're a super fan, because that's where Clemson is based. They're coming directly to our homepage from a mobile device on Google Chrome in an afternoon. So far, all really good signs that they're a super fan. So if we look at this user, they come in to the homepage, and since we're pretty confident that they're a super fan, we'll show them two ads right away. Now there's two reasons for this. The first being that in TigerNet, we know their homepage loads older articles further down on the page. So we want to show them two ads towards the top, because that's where we know the user is most likely to focus their attention. We also know that since this is a super fan, that they're probably going to read a lot of the articles and they know the navigation already on the page. So we can push down a little bit of content below the fold in order to show ads because we know they're going to spend a lot of time on the homepage anyways. So we can see all this by looking at our user session behavior and then comparing it to what we'd expect an other average super fan to look like. So far for this session, our user has a single page view, and they've also spent about 45 seconds on our site, and we've shown them two ads so far. So far, so good. So let's continue on and see what happens next. So the user clicks on an article and begins reading. On this article, we show them two ads again, and so we now have a total of four for the session. Um, and we can show them two ads again because one, we know that they're here to read the article in detail. So we want to front load the experience with ads so that we don't interrupt the reading experience later, where it would be annoying. You'll also note that our ads are close to that picture in the top, because that's where we know their gaze or their intention is likely to start in the beginning. <clears throat> our, so we, we're able to do all this because we know the likely user behavior of these segments. So our system is able to take all this past data into account and in real time, it's able to determine what's the best ad density, as well as ad locations for this user, and adjust their site appropriately. So imagine our user continues browsing another couple pages, not trend here, and they finally wrap up their session. You can see this final ad is at the end of the content. So this is one of our high value ads. It's a big square ad right in the middle. And we show it at the end of the content because we know the user is probably close to ending their session. And so, we want to show it to them at the end, rather than interrupt them in the middle. We also know if we show them at the middle, they're unlikely to stop reading their article and click on that ad. And so we want to wait towards the end, because we don't want to interrupt their experience. So, <clears throat> so our superfan, they ended their session with a total of four page views. They spent almost eight minutes on our site, so that's pretty close to what we'd expect their user segment to look like. And we showed them a total of nine ads, five here and then four that we didn't see, which ends our session EPMV of $6.67. And if you remember, session EPMV, like John and Tyler talked about this morning, is a metric that indicates user session worth. So that's actually pretty good. Um, our super user, it, he behaves as if we would expect. They click on a lot of links, they go to a lot of pages, and generally spend a lot of time on our site. In contrast, our casual user has a very, very different experience of our site. First, you'll note that they're coming in from a different location and also a different traffic source, in this case, social via Facebook, instead of directly to the homepage. And you'll notice that our ad density on the same page looks a little bit different. If we look into the data a little bit more, you can see that they only have a single page view, they spent a lot less time on the site, they're not clicking on a lot of things, and their EPMV is really different as a result. 
Here you can see that high value add that we had at the end of the co content for our superfan is actually now in the middle of the content. That's because we know our casual users, they're probably just reading the first paragraph, getting a summary, and then leaving right away. And so they're not staying for the rest of the article. So it's okay to kind of uh, break up their viewing experience a little bit because they're not trying to read it in very much detail. So today we looked at these two user segments and we looked at a couple metrics uh, that we talked about, but in actuality our system looks at hundreds of different factors all at once in order to make the best decisions because we need a lot of data in order to figure out what the optimal ad density, ad layout, and ad locations are. And remember, as a publisher, um, each and every one of you has existing user segments in your data today. You can go to your site and you can look for these things. Um, and by identifying the right user factors, you can also build out optimizations for your site too. In fact, you should be doing this immediately. Um, so that was looking at our publisher site from a steady state or kind of business as usual. Now let's throw a curveball to extend the sports analogy. <laughs> Um, and see what happens if the users start to behave a little bit differently during an event. So last September for Clemson, um, their kicker, Greg Hugel, he tore his ACL during practice, which was actually a really big deal for them. And so we were able to see in our system how our, uh, our systems responded in real time to an event like this. Right, a day, right away, you can see this is our intraday stats tracker. And on the left are ad impressions and page views, and they both spiked unexpectedly. On the right, you can see that our, cliffs, our, our clicks and our events also shifted dramatically as well. That's, um, that's to be expected, because as we dug more into the data, we realized that there is a huge influx of new users coming in from Facebook, so, uh, Twitter, and Reddit through social media um, as the news kind of broke across the internet. So these are all users who either have never been to the site before or have been but haven't been in a really long time. Uh, digging more into the data, we we're also able to see that our dedicated loyal users who normally spend a lot of time on the site are actually coming in via Facebook or social themselves and they're also refreshing the page a lot more often resulting in <coughs> shorter sessions. Um, and we don't want our, our system to confuse our dedicated users for a casual user because you know, our dedicated users are already used to our site. So if we look at our two different segments again, we're gonna wanna adjust our display strategy in order to accommodate these shifts in events. So let's look at our casual user and super fans again. For a super fan coming into the breaking news article, we know they're probably gonna keep reading the page because it's part of their normal flow. And so we wanna spread out the ads across the entire journey. And that results in kind of consistent page level CPMs across the board, which you can see here. But for a casual user, we know that they're just here for the news article, they're not a loyal user, and they're probably just reading the article um, and then leaving right away. So you can note we monetize that really, really differently than we would a super fan. Uh, as a result, their page level CPM is a lot higher, but they have a lot fewer page views. You can see that res uh, reflected in their respective EPMVs. However, if we look at our super fan as they come into our homepage and then read the breaking news article, we'll still throw a couple ads onto that homepage because one, again, we know this user is familiar with the content and so they're willing to kind of put up with a couple ads in order to find that breaking news article that they're looking for. Um, and then two, our casual user coming into the homepage, we know that they're not familiar with the site. So we don't want to bog down our homepage with a bunch of ads. We know that they're just here for that breaking news article. So we want to get them to that page as quickly as possible in order to uh, monetize that breaking news page more than the other pages. Again, you can see the differences in their respective EPMVs. So comparing these two different users with these two different browse browsing behaviors, you can see that the optimals are really different. And this gets pretty complicated because not only do you have to, one, guess what kind of user is coming into your site before they get to your site, but you also have to show them the right pages and the right order or else you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And it gets even worse, actually. Um, like a lot of things in life, our users don't actually behave according to these two discrete binary categories in that there's not a true pure super fan or a true casual user. 
you might browse the site differently in the morning on your phone than you would in the evening on your tablet. So even individual users have different profile affinities. And everybody who comes to your site actually lives across a spectrum of not just these two user segments, but actually a matrix of multiple different affinity types. So in order to find the best optimizations possible, we're going to need a little bit of help. And that's where artificial intelligence and deep learning come into play. So a lot of people hear artificial intelligence and their eyes glaze over immediately and they get intimidated. This is a term that's been thrown out quite a bit. Um, but it's actually not that hard. Uh, AI simply refers to programming any kind of machine to make a decision as if a person would. So there's simple AI and more complicated AI, but at the end of the day, it's just using technology to help us make the best optimizations possible. Within AI, there's a field called machine learning, and this is where we can have computer software learn without explicit programming, which is just a fancy way of saying these machines can improve themselves over time using more data. Uh, and finally, there's deep learning. So deep learning is actually just where you string together a bunch of different machine learning techniques, and you can solve even more complicated problems. Deep learning is really useful for when you want to look at problems with a high degree of data dimensionality. So that's where you have a lot of inputs and outputs to keep track of at once, kind of like the problem that we just talked about right now. So the benefit of doing machine learning is that our neural network they actually can make decisions as if we would. So it's like you going and optimizing all of your sites automatically at once, instead of having to go through manually and do it one by one, which is a really great thing. So by using deep learning, we can actually employ our AI to help us solve this optimization problem instead of having to do it on our own. You see, as a publisher, there's actually only a handful of factors that we can affect in order to improve our site. We can change the navigation options present, we can change page speed, content positioning, and tweak the ad types, locations, and sizes, as well as the content itself. But there's actually a ton of factors that we need to keep track of, but we can't affect directly. These are things like device type, browser type, the time of day it is, etc. So using our deep learning algorithms, we can take into account all of these different factors, and using multivariate covariance analysis, find out what's best for our site. And here we have a shot of our actual machine learning cluster. On the right here, you can see the average algorithm loss over time. So you have the red and blue charts. The red is our algorithm trying to guess the test data, which is in the blue. And as you can see over time, as you move left to right in the axis, those lines actually get closer and closer together as our machine learning algorithm learns and improves over time. On the bottom are just our different nodes, so these are different stages in the data processing, and we can tweak those in order to get better results. By using this, we're able to generate these histograms of our numerical factor reduction. And so these histograms, each of these mountains have two axes. We have our width as well as our height. The width just represents the number of factors that we need to keep track of in order to make a decision. And then the height represents how effective that decision was using those factors. So we're trying to pick out the narrowest, tallest mountain possible, which you can see highlighted there. And so using this, we can actually reduce the number of factors that we need to keep track of while still improving our effectiveness overall. Here at Azoic, we've spent a lot of time working on our neural network. Uh, we have trained it to account for a spectrum of different user segments for each individual publisher separately. Here you can see is a representation of our neural network. And on the left, you can see our different profile affinity types. There's four listed here, but actually think of hundreds of hundreds that we've come up with. And as they feed into the neural network, each of those individual nodes in the middle processes the data in some way. So that at the end, we can identify our different user segments as we cluster them into different groups, but also improve over time. So any outliers, we get better at cat categorizing them. Okay, so that was a lot, especially right after lunch. Uh, I hope everyone's still with me. Um, as a publisher, having heard this presentation, you might be asking yourself, what are the benefits of all of this? Well, when done correctly, we think the results are actually quite significant. In fact, getting your user segments correct might be the single most powerful thing that you can do for your site outside of changing the actual content. I'm gonna repeat that because it's really important. Getting your user segments correct might be the single most powerful thing that you can do for your site outside of improving your content. 
And for our good friend TigerNet.com, we can see that right here. By getting our user segments correct on TigerNet, we were able to see an improvement of EPMB of almost 22.5%, and revenue improved almost 42%, compared to if we hadn't used user segments, so still using Azoic. On the right, you can see that his user experience metrics actually improved over time, despite the increased revenue, because we're trying to target the right users at the right time, instead of giving frustrating experiences. So that was a lot, and we've shown today that as a publisher, segmenting our users is really important to the business. Why? Well, by identifying and tracking user behavior, we can leverage different technologies in order to help us optimize our decision making, and that improves our revenue as well as experience, user uh, experience at the same time, while increasing user value over the long term. See, at the end of the day, um, as a publisher, we want to be treat, treating each user appropriately, uh, and that means happy users in the long term. And we all know that happy users means happy publishers. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you.